So without any further ado, I will move through and just give you a brief update on myself. So as I mentioned, my name is Mark Cooper from IAC. I have been with IAC for five years, but probably more importantly, um, I've had a uh, long history in the meetings and events world, both in terms of venue operators working for brands such as De Vere Hotels in the UK, Dolce Hotels and Resorts, and also a university conference facility, Warwick Conferences. And welcome to Emma and the team from Warwick today. It's great to see one of my old properties um, joining us. I've also had the absolute pleasure to be involved on the meeting planner side. So both with Sundial Venue Finding Solutions and then more later with Conference Direct in opening up Conference Direct's European division. Um, I've had the fortune to work with organizations such as Coca-Cola, Pearson, Reed Elsevier and a number of others on placing their meetings, conferences and other events around the globe. So hopefully that gives me a little bit of a both understanding um, of both sides of the fence and, of course, a balanced perspective, hopefully, when it comes to looking at some of the trends as it relates to venue operators and also meeting planners. <clears throat> and appreciating that on this call today, the majority are meeting um, venue operators. So we will have definitely a focus on the operational side of these trends. A few of the, our fast facts, as I know some of you joining us today are not familiar with IAC. As an association, we were founded in 1981 as the International Association of Conference Centres. We have just over 300 venues worldwide in 26 countries around the world that all meet IAC's um, certification and the global standards. We represent and our goal is to represent the top 1% of meeting venues worldwide. And when I say meeting venues, I mean very specifically those venues that the average group size are probably less than 150 delegates, with a lot of their meetings uh, being training courses and smaller group sizes of sub 100 venues. IAC is absolutely unique as a organization in the sense that it is one of the only associations out there, and certainly the only global association that has a set of global standards that members have to meet to be able to be considered and recognized a IAC certified property. If you're joining today's webinar and you're not currently an IAC member, of course, myself and the IAC team uh, would be pleased to talk with you if you would like to. Um, understand more and discover more about the um, criteria for membership. So what's going to occupy our time today? Well, um, we will be looking at the, uh, the an overview of some of the key trends um, when it relates to food and drink and the whole coloring, culinary offer around meetings. We'll also look at some of the um, specific areas such as health, well-being, allergens and diets, which we know are uh, creating a major sea change. And in terms of management of these, it is a much larger, and more significant task today than maybe it was even five years ago. We'll touch on some of the local experiences and ways that you can connect regionally to um, uh, your, your delegates regionally to your property. And we'll also look at some of the dining and entertaining options that um, are being taken up by some of our members around the world. So just to really get us started um, today and maybe to set in context um, what um, what, what is the importance of food and beverage when considered in relation to meetings. Um, my colleague, um, who I've known for a number of years, David Taylor, is managing director of a large third party agency um, called uh, Grassroots Meetings and Events. And in a recent industry uh, publication, David mentioned that, you know, the the aim is that largely uninspiring food and drink offerings re are still present at hotel meetings and he also talks about you know um you know the fact that there are many creative chefs in the restaurant industry these days and our experiences in restaurants has you know improved consistently but 
when it comes to uh, meetings and conferences, when it comes to refreshment breaks, David feels that uh, you know these remain largely an unexpired, uh, sorry, an uninspiring experience. And you know he mentions that they continue to see ho hotel groups consolidate, and he's not hopeful for the future of you know the experience of a food revolution in the meetings industry at any one time soon. So a really um, dark picture being painted by David there, and. No, the reason that I'm sharing this today is that I know that um, we, uh, as an industry, in many certain circumstances, you know, really do not provide this within IAC meeting venues. So, you know, when we look outside of IAC venues, the bar is really very low because other venues are offering, you know, or offerings of other venues are not that great. So just to keep that in mind, when we look at some of these trends and these best practices, you know, that if you are at the leading edge, you know, just remember that it's, uh, you know, you're in an industry where still, you know, conference event food, um, you know, is, is open to criticism by industry experts like David. And just one question from Prakash uh, at the beginning. Prakash, we are absolutely recording this session for you. So at the end of this session, my colleague Kate will be sending everybody a recording of the full webinar along with the slide handout. So thank you for asking. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. So let's look at some of the key findings, you know, from the latest IAC Meeting Room of the Future research that we conduct around the globe. And for anyone who's not familiar with this research, IAC Meeting Room of the Future is an initiative that is three years old now. And we have three years of data, benchmarking and reporting of both meeting planners and their perceptions of food and beverage trends, amongst other trends as well. And then also venue operators, we ask the same set of uh, questions and we compare really the differences. There is a dedicated web uh, page on the iacconline.org website that relates to research and trends for the IAC meeting room of the future. So food service that supports various delegate networking sessions is incredibly important now. The spaces outside of the meeting room are as important as the actual meeting and the content itself. And when we looked at the operator survey more recently, 78% of venue operators believe that we as an industry should be proactive in promoting health and well-being. And this is a real high number. And when compared with previous reports, we've kind of moved from a position where venue operators had a view that we are here to serve what our customers want i.e. we will wait for our, our customers and event organizers to tell us what they want when it relates to health and well-being. And now that is a, there is a real sea change in regards to, you know, a very high proportion of venue operators saying, no, we actually should be in a position to promote health and well-being and, and use this as a point of difference with meeting planners and not just waiting for them to come and tell us what they want. Continuous but also adventurous refreshment break stations, which include interactive elements, maybe merging refreshments with team building, are becoming more and more popular. We know that the continuous break stations are a really important element for IAC members, but also more widely in the meetings industry because they promote flexibility, uh, the ability to be able to eat and drink when you're ready as opposed to at a set time. We know all of that. It's really important. But now we're moving into an environment where just as in the restaurants at lunchtime, we saw the introduction of live cooking stations with the chef being out front. We're now seeing this growing in our refreshment break station areas. One example I love to share, which you know went down incredibly well, um, was that uh, in Paris at a conference we ran um, uh, just, just a few short years ago, the chef came out and actually made what we would refer to as Chantilly cream. Actually, the correct, correct pronunciation is Chantilly cream, but they were showing delegates how to make the cream. And then they were also encouraging the delegates to fill their own pastries with the cream. And it just provided a really nice interactive element rather than just putting out a 
a tray of pastries uh, on on the station for people to help themselves. We actually just ran a conference this weekend in Lisbon, and uh, uh, during that conference, we also had pastry making activities as one of the workshops that the hotel provided for us. Um, and they they did that as a uh, as a part of the service. It wasn't an additional cost. So when we look at these. Um, team building and continuous adventurous refreshment break activities could be something that could be delivered um, at a really low or no cost point for your meetings. Planners really should consider the space outside of the meeting room for informal gatherings and food and uh, drink service as well as the typical areas outside of the meeting rooms. The Space outside of the meeting room sometimes is overlooked. Meeting planners will uh, ask for the dimensions or specify the dimensions for the meeting room and be very precise in this requirement. But when it comes to the space outside of the meeting, there is less um, focus on this. Now, if you're a venue operator that have got great spaces outside of meeting rooms for food and beverage service, gatherings, networking, just socializing in general, I would encourage you to make a big point of this in your request for proposals, maybe even comparing your spaces with your direct competition in this regard, because it absolutely is important and critical to, you know, to the, the networking outside of the meeting room. And as we mentioned before, just being able to merge refreshments with team building. Another great example um, that I saw recently was at a conference in the Netherlands where we actually had delegates that using their ingredients and some great big long bread rolls um, uh, had team building activities where they designed, made, presented and then shared um, the making of the most unusual sandwich for their conference. And then that was judged by a culinary expert and the winning team were given uh, was given a prize. Just, you know, a very simple activity to do, created lots of interest, lots of giggles, lots of um, <clears throat> interaction, and turned a typical sandwich lunch into something quite different. And again, at a very low cost point. So great ways for the venue to be able to offer team building um, to, you know, to customers without them bringing in those services. Now, the number of refreshment break stations or spaces um, outside of the meeting rooms, we always ask this question. We're very keen to see whether venues are increasing, decreasing, staying the same in regards to refreshment break stations. And I'm pleased to say, you know, a number of uh, venues already offer um, multiple refreshment break stations uh, around the property close to the meeting space, but also still. You know, 36% is a big number in terms of those that already offer it, still increasing the amount of space and uh, in these areas. And also we're seeing a definite increase in investment of these areas as well in terms of the quality of the furnishings, the type of furniture available to delegates as well, really appealing to the millennials and the incoming generations that want this sort of hangout zone where food, beverage, chance to work, chance to network, you know, are inspiring, inviting, and, um, you know, are spaces where people really want to be. So let's take a look at some of the trends in menu design. We will look at more veg, less meat. We'll look at some of the ancient grains and how these are influencing our meetings. And then we'll take a look at hybrid and fusion cuisine. So some of you may have heard this already. I was fascinated when I heard, um, you know, some of the latest trends related to uh, vegetarianism. Vegetarianism is commonplace these days, but did you know it's still increasing in terms of the number of vegetarians um, that we need to deal with? And it's still increasing at, you know, quite a rapid rate. Some of the top restaurants in Los Angeles and now in other parts of the world, the meat dish, the protein is becoming the side dish and the vegetable dish is becoming the main entree and the main course. So again, just uh, showing a shift towards uh, the uh, popularity of non-meat based dishes, whether you are vegetarian, vegan, flexitarian, pescatarian, whatever it might be, um, just from a choice perspective, people are having, you know, having meat free.
one of our conferences recently, a discussion was had throughout our members as to whether to have maybe, you know, just like we have sometimes a fish Friday, having a meat free Monday, for instance, for delegates. So really a definite positive trend. And then also presentation is everything. Um, and I just encourage all of you to maybe consider, um, you know, the when you run your own meetings, your own uh, buffets for your delegates and meetings at your property, just consider that the presentation of some of those vegetarian options, whether it's um, here in this example, which was in Washington, D.C., um, a property which has used authentic wooden bowls, different um, heights for the buffet and also showing off obviously the great colors that come with you know great vegetable options which sometimes can be difficult to replicate with fried foods and you know the non-healthy options but presentation is everything and you really do find that delegates will gravitate first towards the color and the interest and the intrigue will take them there first and then they may go to the less healthy options um, uh, secondary to that now, until we did this research, I really didn't know what ancient grains were, um, other than thinking that they might be out of date or something crazy like that. But if you just Google it, um, you know, ancient grains are a really important and valuable food type. You know, they're a superfood. They go beyond the, the health reasons. Um, they are genetically free strains. And, you know, even as you see in this example here, Cheerios um, have got an ancient grains version of their uh, breakfast cereal. So really, they are commonplace now. And one of the recommendations that our members give to um, other members around the world is if you're using ancient grains or indeed if you're using ingredients that are good for delegates, then, you know, it's it's no good doing that and being silent about it. Finding a way to label that and put that within the, the menus and also in your communications with meeting organizers is really great way to be able to share the, uh, share the fact that you care and that you are doing something about your delegates' well-being. So now we're going to take a quick look at some of the social media, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, some of the other trends when it relates to food um, that we're seeing maybe outside of the meeting area, but it may well have the um, impact on the meetings industry in the future. Now, the first one is, you know, social media and people's ability to want to uh, be able to take photos and share them. Now, if you're a meeting planner, you're going crazy about um, and putting huge amounts of money and effort and time into trying to encourage delegates to be sharing their experiences from their conference and their meeting with others out there. It helps promote the conference for the next year. It helps promote the organization. Um, and if you as a venue are providing colorful food, Instagrammable food, great presentation of those foods, then you're really going to get that buy-in from delegates. And it's going to be a win-win for the meeting planner. So if you're providing foods around that, uh, that, that, you know, that are, that are, you know, camera friendly, Instagram friendly, again, make a point of it with meeting planners because those meeting planners are being pressurized to get delegates to, to share their experiences. Israeli food is peaking. I know this, it's particularly from my time in the Americas, um, some of the highest quality restaurants and most hard to get to restaurants in major cities around the world are, um, are those which serve Israeli food and they're difficult to get into. And we're starting to see that Israeli food is finding its way, this upscale Mediterranean fare is finding its way into um, meeting uh, uh, meeting menus. So a way to be able to embrace that is very simple by uh, bringing in, you know, next level falafels, um, different uh, dishes using lamb belly, roasted cabbage. Here are some other examples here um, of those trends and um, some of the restaurants that are extremely hard to get into uh, today. Very gourmet coffees, uh, coffee. So coffee, we know, people know the difference between those horrible pump flasks of coffee that we used to get at conferences to the bean to cup, high quality, freshly ground coffees that are so important for today's meetings. But they're going further. Coffees uh, are, you know, are one of those offers within the, the main conference, uh, conference meeting package that 
um, you can really take up a, a gear. Here we've got some very gourmet coffees. You know, if you go to some of the prop, some of the coffee houses like Rubies and Diamonds in Los Angeles, you know, you can order things like, yep, yeah, a coffee, a chocolate fish nitro coffee, and some of those. Um, so again, uh, gourmet coffees are a great way to um, freshen up and really create some interest points throughout your coffee break stations, particularly for your events that are there for multiple days. Just as cocktails are another great way of creating talking points, um, photo points, um, great you know variety and interest at meetings. Also consider that again, when we when we look at incoming generations, the uh, consumption of alcohol is not something that's on the increase. In fact, it's on the decrease. So mocktails, non-alcoholic uh, cocktails, are growing in popularity. And again, you can get some really um, good interest points using mocktails. And you know that links through to meeting planners wanting to create more than you know more interest around. Those, those elements of the conference, which maybe are not considered the most healthy and food and drink, of course, is one of those. So now we'll come on to hybrid and fusion cuisine. So this is the bringing together of different foods from different parts of the world into one buffet station or indeed on one plate in one dish. What's great about hybrid and fusion cuisine is it, it carries a number of benefits. One. Often the color, uh, they, they look um, really interesting, really inviting to delegates. Um, there is also the consideration that you're catering for different dietary requirements or different cultural differences around the world if you have buffets with you know, different cuisines from around the world all at once. Gone are the days where you would have a conference just you know, with one theme, like an Italian theme or an Indian theme for dinner, and everybody buys into that. Hybrid is a way, you know, infusion cuisine is a way to pick up on a number of different um, elements of that. One example of the hybrid fusion is um, one here, which comes from uh, from the Americas, which is the Hawaii ahi poke bowl food. Now, um, ahi poke is a high quality tuna, um, but you know menus are filled with these type of hybrid options, which you know bring and meld the um, you know the different styles and flavors together. Also, it's absolutely ideal for networking friendly when you're working with the small finger food and bowl food type service. And as we mentioned, cultural diversity is, is king. So when we look at health and well-being around meetings, you know, there's an obvious connection uh, between that and, um, you know, and the time that our delegates spend with us. As I alluded to before, you know, delegates can either leave totally uh, motivated, pumped up, enthusiastic and positive following a meeting or they could walk away from that event, you know, feeling um, lethargic, tired, um, maybe a little bit overweight as well, uh, but not feeling great. Well, that's the last thing that we want and it's certainly the last thing that meeting planners want. So there are certain, you know, there are ways that um, you know, delegates really and we can help delegates feel and leave the meeting positive. Now, some of the results that um, that we asked when we asked our venue operators, these results show that venues really are improving our sustainable practices. Look at this, 90% of venue operators said sustainability and sustainable practices are now more important to the venue than they were three years ago. And in equal measure, a huge percentage are implementing more initiatives around health and wellness. So maybe for venue uh, operators, this might be an area just as you have a green team on property likely looking at environmental initiatives. Maybe there should be a team that's really focused on health and well-being of delegates and coming up with great new ideas to be able to tap into that and react to that growing demand from meeting planners, really wanting that to be reflected throughout their meetings. So here are just some of the examples around gut health. Um, not a very nice word, but um, still really important. You know, the use of ingredients such as kimchi, sauerkraut, kombucha, 
Um, you know, again, if these are not terms that you're familiar with, I can assure you a number of food and beverage experts within our venues around the world absolutely are. And many IAC members talk to us about using these sort of ingredients, probiotics, prebiotics, like chicory root, Jerusalem artichoke are all really important elements in the menus that promote good gut health. And I referred to it a little bit earlier, um, you know, when we talk about or when we do do great things um, for our conferences and meetings around, you know, uh, help with delegates health. Also think about uh, the learning opportunities. So many of our delegates don't know about this. Um, some of the food that they eat haven't even considered the type of food they eat. And in this one example, we had a refreshment break uh, buffet and buffet station, which um, was heavily miso infused. And this property here, again, just provided um, a snapshot on the buffet table as to why we've why it was included and why it's considered to be healthy for delegates. So, you know, you're you're giving them a lesson in health and well-being, as well as also promoting that through just the type of food that you provide. Now, when we ask the question of meeting planners, you know, what, what are the habits around your refreshment break times equally? Um, and the number of planners were split. Some of them had been uh, actually providing shorter break times more often. So, for instance, rather than just one mid-morning break or mid-afternoon break, they had two in the morning and two in the afternoon. Now, this works really well when you consider that also the trend is to reduce the amount of time that a session takes place. Gone are those 90-minute uh, workshops in conferences, and now sometimes they are 30 minutes, 40 minutes, or even, you know, an hour in length. So, you know, by reducing the, the learning time for each session, it also creates an opportunity for more of these breaks. In equal measure, we had meeting planners who were uh, increasing the amount of time for their meeting breaks. They used to be no more than 15 minutes, just enough time to grab a coffee and or tea and get back to the meeting room. Now it's completely the opposite. That time outside of the meeting room is really valuable for networking and sharing ideas and discussing the session previously. So we often see now networking breaks, you know, uh, taking 45 minutes. For those meeting planners that was that were running two uh, breaks in the morning or two in the afternoon. Interestingly, those that, that did it reported back that it was important that they only provided food as well as drink um, in one of those two sessions because because otherwise they were at risk of and they'd had experience of overfeeding their delegates. So just something to consider. Two break times doesn't mean two lots of food. Now, we know that food and beverage offerings are directly linked to attendee satisfaction, um, but what we maybe don't consider is also the personalization of the food experience is equally important to be able to guarantee attendee satisfaction. Well, what do we mean by that? Um, if we provide one type of food, one dish for a, a menu, for a dinner or for a lunch, then that's not personalizing the experience. It's certainly not tapping into the, some of the dietary requirements. Now, one of the areas that is an absolute pain point for meeting planners, you, uh, you know, we, without exception, I will have every meeting planner in a meeting room um, when I'm running this session, put their hands up when I ask them if the management of dietary, um, dietary requirements uh, is increasing. They will overwhelmingly say, yes, it does. Um, and it's difficult for them to manage. Now, for venues, that's a really big issue. Now, we heard in the news um, globally the recent uh, court case with pret a sandwich outlet um, at Heathrow Airport and the sad news that one of the passengers unfortunately uh, died as a result of eating sesame uh, within a bread roll that wasn't labelled. So, you know, it just brings home how important this is. When we asked meeting planners as well to consider you know, these requests, look at the number 79% who said that they're re receiving more dietary requests than they were uh, one to two years ago. One of our venues turned around and said that, you know, the, de the guests cannot move forward with the registration if they do not answer 
the dietary uh, question. Uh, apologies, that was actually a meeting planner, not a venue operator, that gave us that feedback. Gluten-free, it's no longer an exceptional request. 100% said they're getting more gluten-free requirements. Some of our venues and operators are really developing their menus so that like vegetarian options, they're not one that they need to ask delegates for in advance. They're just provided as standard during every meal time or break station, even to a point where some of the chefs are really busy developing things like gluten-free sauces to go with steaks, you know, just again so that they, they move more to a gluten-free environment as standard. And if we can take that out of the requests that we ask delegates, then they can just focus more on the more specialist areas. Food labeling in conference buffets is now becoming more common. Um, food labeling even on breakfast stations, where that is where we're listing the ingredients, not only for um, you know looking for ingredients that could be damaging to people's health and tapping into allergens, but just more in general, providing calorific information as well. This is becoming more sophisticated and suppliers of food labeling um, are getting a lot better in regards to helping venues do this, even on a conference buffet um, setup where there are many different types of food on offer. Now, when we asked the venue operators in our latest research, how many of you give actual allergy training to your staff? 75% said that they did. But that leaves 25% still a very big number that is not. And if we talk about the risks and you know how this can actually be fatal for delegates, I would love to be in an environment where we survey venue operators in you know in in the short term and in um, you know in the near future where 100% are giving staff training because it's such an important area. And if we look at that here, you know, just 33% of venues said that they currently include basic nutritional information on the event breakfast, lunch and dinner menus. So um, there's definitely a room, room for improvement in the industry now and meeting planners really want this information. So for the purposes of this webinar, we won't be able to have around the uh, table discussions at this time. But I'd just like to share with you, you know, um, one, one of the questions maybe to take back to your food and beverage uh, team within your venue. You know, ask yourselves, what are the biggest challenges that we've got? How can we be more proactive when offering food and healthy food options? Can we manage dietary needs better? And, you know, what is it that we hope to be doing maybe in three to five years time that's different to what we offer today in our venues around the whole topic of, you know, health and well-being? Now, um, there is a great small guide on trends to nutrition um, and delegate well-being available on the IAC website. I'm also pleased to be able to share with you that in the coming weeks, we'll be adding a new guide, which is Guide to Dietary Management to our research and trends. If you're an IAC member, you will um, receive an email and you'll be able to um, download this report for free. Um, it's aimed for meeting planners and venue operators, and it will be giving some key information around allergens, dietary management, as well as templates to be able to use to send to your uh, meeting planners so that they capture the information in the most organized way that you can then be able to um, decipher it, manage it, and, and importantly, provide for that. So I said that we'd look at some local experiences here. Now, interestingly, um, just based out of New York, there's one of our uh, members, which is Convene. Uh, they have a culinary cookbook, you know, and they're they're even looking at, um, you know, the link to local food with their refreshment breaks to enhance the delegate experiences. So they're inviting brands um, to come in. Here, this one example, you know, there is a uh, an organization called Baldor that, um, you know, is a brand that people recognize in relation to the quality of their root vegetables. So they're bringing that through to um, their, their diet, uh, to their menus and talking about it favorably. They also want to, they're very keen to work with local suppliers, you know, maybe even one that's a famous um, uh, 
a delicatessen or bakery in the city or nearby where you can bring those experiences in and brand them. Interestingly, some of our uh, venue operators did turn around and said to us, you know, don't look at doing this as a upsell, look at doing it as a value add because it's so difficult to um, charge local suppliers a commission for doing it. And actually what they, by encouraging the use of their products on their coffee break stations and pr helping promote them, they become great ambassadors to the venue and in turn, um, you know, refer business in. So it can be a real win-win situation. So really tapping into the local environment. And then I uh, just wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, dining as entertainment. Here you see um, a food wall. Um, some of you may be familiar with food walls. I think this one here looks like it's something like a prawn cocktail food wall. Um, but also we've seen uh, some great donut walls, um, which we actually held at our property, a donut wall uh, at our conference in the Americas in Philadelphia this spring. If anyone came to it, you'll probably remember the smell of it from about, you know, 20 yards away. It was absolutely enticing. Um, it also served another purpose as well as it looking interesting. Um, it was a great selfie uh, uh, opportunity for delegates as well. <clears throat> Culinary team building. Now, I can't emphasize the importance of culinary team building enough. For venues, it's a really great way to be able to offer affordable team building, as I mentioned. But we consider that for our customers as well, it's a great self leveler in terms of um, being able to provide team building where the uh, status of the individual where they are in the organization has very little or no impact on whether they're successful in the culinary team building environment. So it is really a great way to be able to um, provide experiential learning, be able to turn food into an interest point. And you'll also see uh, the use of the food truck here as well. Um, this was actually one of our conferences that we had in London last year. And I go to many conferences around the world, even ones where we've got 2000 delegates attending where food trucks are used um, just to create that point of interest. And of course, they're also brilliant because they take delegates outside so they get into the fresh air. I'm sure you've got your own examples of, you know, dining as entertainment. Um, one of the others, which is a video that I can't share, um, is a, a, another great example is where um, where they use projectors and they um, use a holographic image that projected onto the table during a dinner. It's a great one. It's called um, Skull Candy um, and uh, you'll find it on YouTube if you just um, if you Google Skull Candy on there. So one of the other trends that really is taking off is, well, you know, we remember we talked about personalization of food. Um, think about personalization of, of dining spaces. Now, this is actually an image of one of our members in London in the UK. And although this looks like a relatively small setup and small restaurant, I can guarantee to you that this um, this restaurant goes on and on and on, and it seats up to 400 delegates in any one day, and it provides different styles of seating. So some want the low tables, just the three or four people around it. Others want high tables, some want group dining. If again, you're going to really react to the personalization uh, aspect of food and beverage service, then providing different seating arrangements is a really good way of doing that. And here's a video I'd like to share with you now, just another example. Hopefully over this um, platform you can follow the video, but it may be a little bit choppy.
So the one thing I can't do is tell just how well you were able to see that, but just to be able to summarize, it's um, using um, 3D uh, video, uh, 3, 3D capture to be able to create on the table um, an actual look and feel of a dish. Think about this, you know, although, you know, it's quite scary where we're going in relation to, you know, augmented reality and, you know, visualization of things, but we're still very much an industry where you choose a dish based upon what you read in text only. That's what a menu is. Unless you go to some of those, uh, you know, more dodgy um, uh, Chinese restaurants where uh, every dish has got a picture of it next to it. But, you know, the concept of it is actually sound. We want to look and see what we're eating, going to eat and what we're choosing, as well as being able to read it. And think about it. How many of you have discounted a dish just because of how it sounds and then just to find when you're at a restaurant, your colleague ordered it. And when you look across the table, you think, wow, that's really great. I'd have had that if I'd have known that that's what it would have been. So we we'll expect to see more in regards to um, you know, conference dining and meeting dining where delegates will be able to get a better understanding of what it is that they're about to order. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I have concluded our webinar for today. I'm